Pessoal, estamos aqui, como vocês podem ver, com o psiquiatra Anthony Daniels, que vocês conhecem como Theodore Darimbo, que vocês são fãs, eu sou fã, a gente acompanha muito o trabalho dele, os livros, os artigos. Ele está lançando seu novo livro aqui no Brasil. Uh, a Faca Entrou, pela editora E Realizações, com prefácio do meu amigo Martim Vasco da Cunha. Uh, recomendo, evidentemente, todos vocês comprem todos os livros dele, e esse aqui especificamente, e é sobre ele que nós vamos conversar agora. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. So, uh, let's start uh, talking about your new book. So, uh, what's up about the main theme of the, the book? Well, the, the book is a, a memoir of my time in prison as a, as a doctor. <laughs> uh, uh, I spent uh, 14 or 15 years working in prison, and uh, I suppose the main theme is the mentality of prisoners as I saw it, as I understood it. I hope it's amusing, uh, but also serious. As what I understood about the book is that the, you saw some kind of pattern that the prisoners, they try to detach them for their crimes or their deeds, their responsibilities. So is that correct and why is that so? Uh, well, I think that that is correct. Uh, and uh, the... Uh, Doing that, detaching yourself from your responsibility is just human nature. We all do it, or at least I do it, when I do <laughs> and I think I'm human. Um, uh, when I, if I do something wrong, or when I do something wrong, my first thought is to make excuses for myself. I explain it, I'm tired, or, uh, or something I've been provoked, or whatever it is, I make excuses. But there's a still small voice in the back of my head, which seems to be about him, <laughs> which, which says, you're not telling the whole truth. And but you think that the prisoners have this kind of sense too? I think they do, but the problem is that they're actually encouraged uh, not to listen to it. Okay. Uh, or at least they're not forced to uh, by him. No one tells them to listen to it. If I can give you a concrete example, I'll give you a concrete example. I had a, a, a prisoner, and this is part, incidentally, this is part of the, real, the psychology of the real me. The real me is a, a very good person, irrespective of what I actually do. So this prisoner had thrown acid in the face of his girlfriend because he was very jealous. He thought she was having an affair, and he threw acid in. Now he denied that it's he, a kind of crime that is wrapping up, no? Yes, yes, it's, it's increasing. Long, uh, yes, yes. But this was before the increase, actually. But he uh, he denied he'd done it, and I said, well, why are you accusing me? He said, well, I, I can't have done it because I can't remember doing it. So I said, well, if you, and he couldn't remember the time. So I said, well, if you can't remember, you can't really deny it, can you? And he said, well, uh, I know I didn't do it because I don't do things like that. So a little while later in the interview, I said, have you ever been in prison before? And he said, yes, he had been in prison before. And what, what was it for, I asked. He said, well, I, uh, I threw ammonia in a girl's face. So apparently the big difference... <laughs> Yes. Is, is, oh, as, okay. as they are a male, yeah. ammonia doesn't count. <laughs> yeah. uh, and if you don't confront him with the absurdity of this, he can go on thinking that he is actually a good person who doesn't do those kind of things, even though there is in his mind, of course, someone saying you did do those things. I mean, Nietzsche talks about that. My memory says I did it. Uh, my self, uh, my self-esteem says I didn't do it. My memory gives way. I think even Adam Smith wrote about yeah, yes. the moral sentiment, yes. the theory of moral sentiment. So, uh, <clears throat> so uh, if you never confront anybody with these with these lies, if they don't confront themselves, uh, uh, then they can go on thinking that they are uh, they are good people despite all the things that they do. 
and uh, I, I can. It's easy to understand how bad it is for this criminal justice and to to spread crime. But as a society, uh, people are doing this kind of thing too. Yes. So, uh, can you tell what you think that's the social consequences about this kind of behavior? Uh, well, I think uh, or mindset. Yes, the <laughs> mindset. Yes, the mindset. Uh, very, very peculiar ideas. I never listen to the radio <coughs> in England or anywhere else, and I never watch television. But once in, I was in a taxi, and uh, there was a, a, a mother. Um, uh, she was uh, she was being interviewed about her son who had just been caught, I think, for his two hundred and fifty sixth burglary. And the phrase she used is, "He's a good boy, really." Ah. Uh. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so you can see, but he is <laughs> deep inside. Of the deep inside, he's a good boy. So apart, very deep. apart from the two of them, <laughs> he's a very good boy. He's nice to his mother and so on. And uh, and uh, and uh, increasingly, we think like that. And of course, it it allows people to behave very badly while I'm thinking that actually I'm not a bad person. And this. It seems to me to be generalized, and in, at a more intellectual level, we think that having the correct opinions is virtue. In, in the educated class now, having the right, right opinions is more important than how you actually behave. Yeah. Or the right stance. The right stance, yes. Yeah. yeah. That, uh, uh, and know what uh, it, the slide is. Uh, uh, about the consequences, people don't think about the, the real consequences the real about, about their yeah, ideas. No, no. The ideas are more important than the consequences. And the ritual sign. Yes, yes. And, and, and we can see this in all Western world, huh? I think so. I mean, I think it's probably, I don't know about how bad it is in Brazil. But it's, it's bad. It's very bad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, well, I see a lot of it uh, in, in Europe. And I mean, in from some points of view, it's funny. I mean, when the mother says, my boy is a good boy, really, <laughs> uh, um, you can't help laughing. But it, the problem is that no one actually, during that interview, no one said to her, how can you possibly say your boy is a good boy, really, when he's done all this, when he has made the life of very many people miserable? I mean, we laugh at the burglaries, yeah. but, it, but to be burgled is a very... It's a very miserable thing. It makes you feel very unsafe. Yes. So, what can we do about it? Well, I think the first thing to do is to confront these, uh, to have the courage to confront uh, this kind of thinking. For example, uh, the mother who said, my boy is a good boy, really, probably has had a very hard life. That is probably true. And it's true in most cases of the criminals that I saw. They have had hard and difficult lives. But I, I remember a burglar came uh, um, to me and, and uh, he kept on being um, uh, caught, which means that he was a very incompetent burglar. So it's very difficult to be caught by the British police. He <laughs> yeah. yeah. But nevertheless, he managed it. And I think quite often it's because they really want to. In England. But anyhow, uh, he said to me, uh, Doctor, do, do you think uh, I keep burgling because of my childhood? I said, No, it's got nothing to do with it. And, and he, he was very, <laughs> very surprised. Very surprised. Very surprised. He said, Well, uh, why do I do it? So I said, Well, stupid and lazy and you, <laughs> and, you, and you want things that you're not prepared to work for and uh, he's, you think they would get he would be very angry but he's, he laughed <laughs> <laughs> because he knew that it, it was true it was true and then it, but it was also true that he did have a very miserable childhood that was true and once you once you start talking about that having cleared out of the way the idea that he broke into houses because he had a miserable childhood, uh, as if there was nothing in between miserable yes. childhood. He was just a billiard ball being hit by another billiard ball. 
Uh, once you've got that out of the way, you could talk about his miserable childhood, his terrible childhood. Uh, and of course, he did have a, a terrible childhood, as many of these people do. But we encourage, I mean, our society has encouraged people to have terrible childhoods, actually. And yesterday you talk about that you, you really don't see a, a real connection between this kind of social or economic background and the tendency to, to do crime. And well, not, 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 not poverty. poverty. Poverty does not explain crime. If you take Britain, for example, it, it is true that in most societies, most criminals, at least of the, the cruder kind, uh, I won't talk about the Brazilian kind of criminals, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, 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 you know, robbers and uh, burglars and the murderers and people who are violent. It's true that they come from, from the whole, they tend to come from the lower uh, social echelon. But if you look at a country like Great Britain, for example, the fact is that uh, criminality has increased along with wealth. If you look at the figures for 1900, or even earlier actually, the poverty was incomparably greater than it is now. I mean, there were people who didn't have enough to eat, there were people who were starving, they lived in very crowded conditions, they had uh, uh, really very, uh, 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 the kind of life that nobody, almost nobody, as here, and maybe it exists in in the northeast of Brazil. Uh, I don't know, but but certainly I doubt whether it is as miserable even in the worst favelas of Sao Paulo as yes. it was in London as it was in London in, in 1900. Yet, in and even during the Great Depression, for example, there were more robber there were there are now more robberies in a month in one borough in London than there were in the whole of Great Britain in a year uh, in uh, 1920 or 1930. So this can't possibly be explained yeah, sure. by, by poverty. And what is the source of this kind of mentality? What's the, who, who are the people that are like sponsoring or defending this kind of view that uh, you can't be detached of the, what you do, what you think, what... Well, they're all... I, I blame uh, psychologists, sociologists, <laughs> criminologists, <laughs> journalists. <laughs> they are the principal you, cause... The usual suspects. <laughs> they are the fundamental cause of crime. Uh, well, I mean, I'm, I'm joking a little because, of course, the... the the uh, immediate cause of crime is almost by definition the decision of the criminal to commit it. Yes. And but his decision is affected. And, and, and it's a kind of idea that is almost being uh, uh, prohibited to say now that the, 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 you have to blame the criminal for the crime. Yes. So, but uh, I, I mean, legally speaking, at least in Britain, and I'm sure it's the same in uh, in Brazil, in uh, the legal system. The person has to know what he's doing in order for there to be a crime. Because if he doesn't know what he's doing, it's not a crime. Therefore, he must have thought about it. He must have decided to do it. That decision can be instantaneous, of course. Yes. Uh, but but it, he has to have the mens rea, the, the guilty mind, uh, before he can be charged with a, or convicted of a crime. So that's the first thing. However, of course, people's mentalities are, are, are changed by ideas. And actually, they, they receive their ideas from, from intellectuals, the, the ideas filtered out. Let me give you a concrete example. I met a young man who had stolen 600 cars. Um, and he'd made quite a lot of money from doing so, but eventually he was caught. And um, he said to me, do you think I'm addicted to stealing cars? Um, in other words, this was a kind of illness because people now believe, in my view, wrongly, that addiction is a straightforwardly an illness. It's like 
Parkinson's disease or multiple sclerosis. It's something that just happens to you. It's yeah. not something and you, you can do. do There's anything. nothing you can do about it once you know. And that's the official line of the National Institute on, on Drug Abuse. If you look on their website, they'll tell you that the addiction is a chronic relapsing brain disease. And that's all there is to it. Uh, anyway, he said, do you think I, I have an addiction? Now, the interesting thing is that not very long before, the idea that stealing cars could be an addiction had entered the academic literature. And you saw uh, diagrams of the, uh, neuro uh, uh, the neurological circuits, which meant that people who stole cars were stealing cars because of something going on uh, in their brain, which of course they couldn't control. Do anything about they couldn't do anything about. Now, I don't believe that this man would have said that, would have developed this theory by himself. I think he, 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 would have, uh, he would have heard it from somewhere, even if it's just as a rumor. Okay. In, in Brazil, we have a, a kind of line of thought that when uh, some politicians are going to jail or being uh, uh, charged, prosecuted, they are saying that we all are corrupt now. <laughs> so if you, uh, like, uh, cheat in the uh, uh, like in school yeah. or if you uh, uh, if you try to avoid a, a, a parking uh, ticket. A ticket with giving some bribe to the police yes. man uh, you are equal to the the, the politician yeah. that steals one billion dollars you know yeah. because we are all corrupt it's a, a corrupt society mentality what do you think about this kind of line of thought? Well, this is the, the usual kind of way in which all, kind, all limits, all borders are dissolved. Um, so, as you say, there's no difference between small things and large things, because, of course, there is a continuum. Uh, I'll, give you an, I'll give you another concrete example. Um, in England, the age of consent to sexual relations is 16. So before then it is uh, what in America is called statutory rape. Here it is 14. Okay, okay. Now, what I discovered was that men who went to prison for having uh, sexual relations with underage girls, they said often that the parents were complicit in the situation. And, I, and that was actually true. I was able to, to find that that was true in, this, in quite a number of cases. And, the, <clears throat> and I, sometimes I saw the parents of, of the girl. And I said, you know, you, you've, you've cooperated or, uh, with this. And they would say to me, well, are you saying that on the 16th birthday, a girl is able to give consent, but a day before, she's not able to give consent. And I said, I said, well, if you use that argument, then there is no age of consent. Yes. Uh, and maybe the age of 16 is the wrong age or whatever. But the fact is that people are not prepared to accept limits that either they agree with or they... To draw a line. They're not prepared to draw a line. Uh, and because nature, generally speaking, has continuum, uh, continuum rather than categorical differences, although there are some categorical differences, this means that all um, there are no limits to people's behaviour. And actually, uh, what uh, I always remember, what Burke says, that man is, men are uh, uh, qualified. For liberty in exact proportion as they are prepared to place a limit on their own appetites. Great. And, and the fact is that I don't think we're very good at placing limits on our own appetites. No, great. So, uh, thank you for your time. I thank you. That, and uh, I really encourage our uh, listeners uh, to buy the new book. 
falando em português agora, por favor, comprem esse livro, esse livro é muito importante para o momento que a gente está vivendo agora. É verdade. É verdade. <risos> e leiam todos os livros que vocês puderem. Uh, thank you for uh, your kindness, your great speech yesterday and this conversation. Thank, thank you. you.